Hello, everyone. My name is Ariella Wagner. I'm the founder of Sunray Construction Solutions, a national construction document service. We help thousands of general contractors, subcontractors, and suppliers throughout the United States secure their lien and bond claim rights. Today, we have a very important webinar dealing with material, material price escalation and the amazing board certified construction attorney, Alexander Barthet, will be conducting a one hour webinar to discuss these very important matters. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Alex Barthet. Thank you very much, Ariella. Again, my name is Alex Barthet. I'm a board certified construction lawyer here in Florida. And today we're gonna to talk about how to deal with material price escalation, a real problem that is affecting the construction industry. Um, and today's webinar, we're gonna talk about um, three things. First, we're gonna talk about the current state of material prices. Then we're gonna talk about how to deal with your existing contracts, contracts you have already signed maybe earlier this year, the end of last year, and how to uh, try to adjust those prices. Um, and then we'll talk about what to do with new contracts. Um, I'm gonna go through some very specific um, things that you can do and try, um, as well as give you some sample contract provisions to use in your contract. Um, so definitely make sure you have your pen and paper handy, but also know that at the end of this presentation, Ariella and her team at Sunray will be sending everyone a copy of this PowerPoint, so you have it. Um, and you can always go back to the Sunray website um, after the fact and, re and view this webinar. So let's get right into it. What is the current state of material prices? I probably don't have to tell you, you all probably know better than I do. Um, this is the Cummings Building Value um, Index. Uh, th this is a summary of the last 12 months of price escalations. As you can see on the high end, steel pipe and tube is up 57%, um, but other things, that are very standard like steel, uh, sorry, gypsum products, 21%, uh, um, lumber and plywood, 48%. So these are significant price increases. Um, this is a great resource, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but when you ask someone to give you more money for the contract you have already signed, um, one of the things they're gonna wanna see is some hard evidence associated with the material price increase. So providing this chart is one good resource. Another two or two other resources are the AGC, uh, Associated General Contractors 2022 Construction Inflation Alerts. They've been putting them out almost monthly. So if you Google that, you'll get the latest version. Has a lot of great information from the AGC Economist. Um, lots of charts, graphs, uh, information that you can use to support your claim. Um, or request for uh, a material price increase. The FDOT, Florida Department of Transportation Construction Cost uh, Indicators, uh, is another great resource. Uh, they focus primarily on um, horizontal construction. So a lot of things like uh, asphalt um, and those types of things are in the FDOT Construction Cost Indicators report, uh, and that comes out periodically. So if you Google that, you'll find the latest version. Um, so if, if at any point you need to provide someone evidence that this is really happening, that the prices are really going up and by how much, these are all great um, resources you can refer to. All right, let's get right into the meat of it here. How to deal with your existing contracts. Um, so the first thing you have to figure out is what kind of contract do you have? Uh, so a verbal contract is much easier to negotiate around, right? Because, you know, it'll be just your word versus their word that the price uh, went up. It didn't go up, you know. Uh, so if you have only a verbal contract, you probably have little concern or you should have little concern that you're going to be bound by that price um, because there's no written agreement. But if you have a quote or a proposal that has a price, now it gets a little more complicated. 
So the first thing you want to look at is, does that proposal or quote have an expiration date? So, you know, in, in the old days, I don't know, the middle of 2021, the quote would say, you know, this quote is good for 30 days. So if you signed it and sent it back, you now have a binding contract with the other side for that amount of money. So does it have that? I know that uh, vendors now and subcontractors that are giving quotes say it, it has an expiration date that pretty much says this quote is good through the end of today. So take a look at what the proposal or quote says as far as an expiration date. If the offer or quote or proposal or estimate has been tendered, you've given it to the other side or the other side has given it to you, um, you know, one way to end the relationship is to retract the quote. So if you don't have a confirmation that it's been accepted, then you can retract it. So that's another thing that you should consider doing. So if you've sent someone a quote and you're like, geez, I, I don't think I can honor that price anymore, but they haven't responded back, well then send them a letter or an email and uh, indicate that your quote or estimate is has been retracted. So now let's get into the harder situation where you have a specific written contract, um, you know, multi pages, lots of terms and conditions. What we find is typically these contracts have very firm pricing um, provisions. Uh, so they have a firm, no escalation provision. So it may be a sentence, it could be a paragraph, but in essence it says, under no circumstances, is your price allowed to change for any reason, no matter the cause? Um, so first you wanna look at your written contract that you have and see what does it say about escalation. If it says nothing about escalation, just know that the law generally will impose upon you a, an understanding that, that barring an exculpatory clause, some clause that would give you the right to change a term in the contract, like the price, that your price, even if there's no, no escalation clause, is firm. So again, let me reiterate, you look at your contract, there's no, um, no escalation clause. It just says that your price is $100,000 to do this work. Unless you can find a provision in the contract that says that you can change that price, more likely than not, that price is still a firm price because it's listed in the contract as one of the material terms. So let's take a look at some of the other things that you can do or consider trying to get a price adjustment. So the first thing, is the contract that you're dealing with signed? Um, if it isn't, don't sign it. Um, I had a client come to me the other day and he said, um, Alex, I've got this problem, I've got this contract, it's sitting on my desk, it has a no escalation clause in it. I can't do it for the price I quoted. What should I do? I said, well, did you sign it? He said, no, I haven't, I haven't signed it. I said, well, then you don't technically have an agreement. Um, so just say you don't agree. Now, there are some conditions to this. It's not always as simple as when you get the contract and you don't sign it, then you're off the hook. And the reason is that maybe when you submitted your bid, you entered into an agreement at bid submission time that says you will agree that if we award you this contract, you will be bound by our standard terms and conditions. And usually they'll attach a copy or reference a copy or send you to a website that has the terms and conditions. Maybe you signed an LOI six months ago, a uh, letter of intent, and that letter of intent required performance, required that you be bound, required that um, by signing this letter of intent, you agree to all of the terms and conditions of our contract. If that's the case, even if you haven't signed the actual contract, we have to look at those issues because you may still be contractually bound to honor that price. The next thing to look at is if there was a bond that was required, and if so, was it issued? If that bond is required but has not yet been issued, I would suggest to you, you don't issue that bond. If you are going to consider pulling out of this contract, 
you want to minimize the amount of entanglements that you have and issuing a performance and payment bond to the owner or the contractor or the subcontractor um, complicates things a great deal because if you provide that bond and they are in possession of it and you pull out of the contract, they can make a claim on your payment and performance bond. Now, this is a catch-22. Just know that if you promise to issue a bond in your contract and you fail to issue that bond because you are retracting your agreement to participate in the contract, that that by itself is a default, right? So you have a default for not doing the work, but you have another default because you agreed to provide a bond and you never did. So keep those things in mind. But again, if you know that you're not going to do the work, um, don't make things worse by issuing the bond. We see now that because this is happening, uh, owners and contractors are demanding bonds much earlier from their subcontractors because they recognize that having a bond from a sub limits their ability to not honor the contract because of price escalation. So typically we would see um, buyouts of subcontracts happening much closer in time to when that con subcontractor needed to do work. We're seeing that buyout happen much earlier. Additionally, even when the buyout occurred, we would typically see bonds issued closer in time to when the contract, the subcontractor was doing the work. Now we're seeing those bonds being issued uh, right away when the contract is, is signed. The other thing we're seeing more and more of is bid bonds on private projects. So typically a bid bond was something you would see on a public project. A bid bond is a bond that says you agree that if you submit a price and you issue a bid bond, that if you are awarded the contract, that you will honor that contract and sign that contract. So one of the ways that contractors on private jobs are getting subcontractors to commit to um, honor their price and sign a contract is that they're now demanding bid bonds from their subcontractors who submit prices to them. So those are all the things we're seeing happen in the marketplace now. Um, so just know that if you submit a bid and they require a bid bond and you provide the bid bond, if you don't sign that contract, depending on the terms of the bid bond, you will be liable for 10 to 20% of the contract value if you don't honor your agreement to participate in the contract. So let's take a look at some other contract provisions that you should consider. Um, force majeure. This one gets bandied about all the time. Um, so people come to me and they say, well, Alex, um, you know, I should be able to get out of this because of force majeure. Uh, and my conversation with them goes something like this. Most contracts that we see um, have a very limited, if any, force majeure con uh, provision. You need to understand that force majeure as a concept would exist if we had a verbal agreement. But if we sign a contract and it has all the terms and conditions and it doesn't have a force majeure provision, you don't automatically get to imply that a force majeure provision exists. Moreover, we see force majeure provisions in contracts that, that are very limited in nature. For example, it has a force majeure provision, but it only but it says um, we will only allow for a delay or a change in this contract to the extent that there is a hurricane lasting more than three business days that affects the critical path of the schedule. So, you know, that's a that's an example of a force majeure provision that may be in your contract but it is very limited in nature. But you still need to check. One of the things that you may be able to hook into is if you can find any provision in your contract, particularly a force majeure provision that talks about war or armed conflict generally. And if you can tie 
what's happening to you, to the armed conflict in Ukraine, then now you at least have something to talk about. Um, so that's another area you can look at. Uh, surprisingly, by the way, I saw a contract uh, last week that allowed a subcontractor to get an extension for all things beyond their control. Well, that's pretty broad. Um, I was surprised to see that in the contract. So that is a provision that may exist in your contract. Um, so you want to see, does it exist? And if so, can you argue that these price escalations were beyond your control? Other provisions to look at, changes in the law. Um, some contracts say that you are allowed to make a claim for time and money if there's a material change in the law. So let me give you an example of a situation that happened to a client of ours. They are doing work on a set-aside contract, so they have to comply with the prevailing wage. Well, the prevailing wage for one of their scopes of work went from $16 an hour in 2021 to $38 in 2022. Well, they budgeted a $5 increase, not a 100% increase in the wage, which uh, effectively resulted in a several hundred thousand dollar loss for them on this project because of the amount of work and the, this, this prevailing wage increase, plus all the other increases. So we looked at their contract and, and they have a change in law provision that says any material change in the law may allow you to make a claim for time and money. So they've submitted their request for extra time and extra money based on this change in the law, which is the change in the prevailing wage rate for some of their scope of work. Um, other issues to look at. What does your contract say about change orders and claim procedures? Um, you need to make sure that you look at this section because what we're talking about now effectively constitutes either a claim or a change order because you're going to ask for more time and more money. Can you tie any of this escalation to new work? That is the easiest way to try to make a claim for more money and more time is if your scope changes and as a result of your scope changing, you can try to get more time and more money. Um, if all else fails, um, some contracts have a claim provision that says, if you wanna make a claim for time and money for any reason, you know, you need to follow the terms of this section. Um, so you need to find that section and follow the terms. Typically it's provide notice in writing to them within, I don't know, 48 hours, 72 hours, seven days um, with all the backup for the claim. Usually it's tied to, or your recovery is tied to being able to prove up your claim Number one, and number two, the contractor getting paid by the owner for your money. Um, so it's typically tied to someone else paying so that they can pay you. Uh, other than that, you know, you need to seek legal counsel because you're going to probably have to get pretty creative. Um, so I'll give you an example of one that we're dealing with uh, currently. It's an interesting set of factual. Um, it's, it's a very factually interesting scenario. Um, and that's what you have to look for. You know, are there unique facts or circumstances around your situation that can give you a hook to make the claim? So in this example, the one that I'm dealing with now, the contract was signed in the middle of 2020 with an estimated start date at the end of 2020 and a completion date at the end of 2021. Client signs the contract, issues the bond, and is just told to wait. We'll get back to you. We'll let you know when we'll issue a notice to proceed. Well, we're currently in May of 2022. Months, eight months passed when the job is supposed to have been completed and it hasn't even started. If my client were to start this project today, they would suffer about a $600,000 um, loss based on the price escalation of their materials associated with this work. So what we're 
doing is we're arguing that the contract is effectively void because the time period associated with the work has come and gone. It hasn't even started and it is not reasonable to um, expect someone to hold a price for effectively almost two years. Um, so we're going to uh, we're going to cancel the contract, send a letter canceling the contract, and we are talking to our surety to make sure that they're on board so that they stand with us because we suspect that when we terminate this contract, they're going to make a claim on our performance bond for uh, our unilateral termination of the contract. So we're trying to get our ducks lined up in a row so that when we pull the trigger, we've done all the preparation we need to. So that's an example of a situation that doesn't fall quite within any specific contract provision, but is unique to the facts that are presented. Um, the other thing that we're seeing a lot of is vendors, material uh, suppliers, manufacturers not honoring their prices. So wh what are what can you do about that? Was the price in writing? Um, do you have a firm quote? from your uh, material supplier or vendor. Um, and the question is, is it firm? Meaning, is there any exculpatory provision in their contract, uh, in their quote to you? Um, many times we see orders placed by the on the phone, via email. Um, so there's no, there's no price. So you submit a, um, you know, you get a, a rough quote from the concrete supplier so that you can, generate a bid, and then when you go to order, now the price is 10, 20, 30% more. You don't really have a quote if all you did was get a price from them. What you need is you need them to give you a price that says this price is good for this period of time for these materials. Um, that at this point now, I would tell you, is probably next to impossible. Most manufacturers, um, we see are not giving price quotes with any duration on them, number one. And number two, we're also seeing that they're saying, actually, the price that I tell you is just an estimate. The price that it's actually going to be is the price when we ship. So if you order today and we ship in a month, it's not today's price. It's the price that exists when we ship the product. So that's what we're going to be able to honor and nothing else. Um, you know, you can sue them if you have a written price quote that's firm, um, but do you really want to do that? They're probably going to cut you off, um, and you may not be able to get substitute materials for any less uh, any less money. So, for example, we've seen material suppliers who have reneged on our on to our clients on uh, firm prices that they got. So, for example, concrete suppliers, um, you know, we represent a very large shell contractor. They received a firm price quote that got them uh, through the middle of 2022. And in early 22, um, they received an email from the concrete supplier that said, yeah, the price is going up. And we called them and, they, and we told them about our quote. And they said, yeah, we don't care. Sue us if you want to. But by the way, if you um, don't accept or don't agree to pay the price increase, we're not going to provide you concrete. And oh, by the way, everybody else in town um, is on allocation, so they're not going to be able to give you concrete either. And their price currently on the street is more than my price to you, even with the price increase. So what do you want to do? Um, so it puts you in a very difficult position. As an example, in, in the situation that I just described to you, my client made the very difficult decision of having to suck it up because he had no choice. He had no place to get alternate material. And even if he did, that material was substantially more expensive than even the price he was getting with the price increase. So keep all of those things in mind um, as you deal with this problem. Um, so what's next? You know, you can switch providers, vendors, subs, or GCs, but that's gonna affect the cost and the the schedule of the project. Um, and if you can get new prices, they're, pro they're probably going to be higher than what anyone is asking you to pay now. 
Um, so I'll give you another example. We represent a, a large general contractor and they are about 20% of the way through a project and now their subs are going back to them and saying, we can't honor your prices. It's a $75 million project. So it's resulting in about a $7 million price increase on the project. And the subs are telling my client, the GC, well, um, sue me. I, I'm not going to lose money on this job. So do what you got to do, but I'm not honoring my price. Um, so that's putting the contractor in a difficult position. But what I told the contractor was, you know, the owner is not any different than you are with your subs. If you go to the owner and tell the owner, look, I'm dealing with this problem. Let's try to work it out. But no, if, if, if we can't work it out, I'm going to have to walk off this job. And what is that going to do? That's going to cause you to have to go get another contractor who's going to charge you even more than what I'm going to charge you, even with a negotiated price increase. Um, and it'll severely impact your schedule. So what we're seeing in general is a significant renegotiating of contracts um, that technically shouldn't happen, right? A contract is a contract. It should be honored. And legally, you may be able to... Um, win in a case, in a court case, but what good does that do for you in your project if you're not actually able to finish it? Um, so let's talk about the act of requesting an accommodation. You need to send that request in writing as soon as possible. You need to provide the backup, um, a summary with supporting documentations, documentation, um, of what you're asking for and why you're asking for it. You need to include written proof of the price that you got when you bid the job and the price that you are currently receiving from your vendor. Um, what we're seeing is that when clients are submitting a request for a price adjustment, an accommodation, and they are not providing all of that backup, if they're getting any price adjustment, it is substantially worse than had they had all of the backup to support the fact that they did what they could at the beginning of the job to get a price, and now it is substantially more. So let me show you a sample letter that you can use to try to make a price adjustment request. So here it goes. As you know, Ongoing supply chain issues and global geopolitical events continue to escalate the price and constrain the availability of raw materials for construction. The Associated General Contractors most recent economic survey shows that the, that the price of materials and services for construction jumped more than 21% from March of 2021 to March of 2022. We are seeing similar increases in materials used on this project. Notwithstanding, we are committed to mitigating the impacts of these market conditions on behalf of our clients and partners. At the same time, and in large part for the reasons that caused the escalation, the region is seeing record demand, sale prices, and rental rates. Um, many developers and owners are commanding higher prices than the original pro forma is projected, which is leading to greater profit. Prior to this notice, we have used extraordinary efforts to try to absorb the cost increases and maintain the project schedule. The potential delays in the ever-increasing material costs are without any fault or responsibility on our part. Unfortunately, we cannot continue to absorb the costs and are now forced to reach out to open a dialogue about price escalations and possible time extensions. Please consider this letter as our notice of claim and request for an equitable adjustment. It continues to be our goal to minimize costs and maintain the project schedule. To do this, we must all work together. In the long run, this is in the best interest for all of us. Please, keep, please let us know your availability to meet to discuss an amicable resolution of these issues. The, back of our, up, the backup of our claim is attached for your review and consideration. Thank you, and we look forward to hearing from you very soon. So that is a sample letter that you can use and tweak as you see fit to make a request for a price adjustment. To the extent that you have specific contract provisions that you can cite to support your um, request, you wanna go ahead and do that. Um, we are typically seeing clients get between zero, nothing, um, and 50% of their request. 
It's rare that we're seeing clients get all of their requests, um, but generally speaking, a third to 50% is what we're seeing the clients receive. We see success rates higher on private projects and lower on public projects. Um, and remember that most every job has a contingency, and that contingency um, is low-hanging fruit for you to the extent you make a request for adjustment early. So you want to be submitting your request as early as possible um, so that if there's any contingency, you can fall within it. A few things to keep in mind. Know that threatening to stop work on most projects under most contracts is a default in and of itself. So you have to be very careful about telling people that you're not going to continue working, threatening that you're going to walk off a job, threatening that you're going to terminate the contract. Um, so be very careful. If you're bonded, as I mentioned before, they may call your bond. Um, don't forget about asking for time extensions, right? So not only are you dealing with a price issue, you're probably dealing with material delays in shipment and delivery. So make sure that you submit that request, not only for time, uh, not only for money, but for time. Your contract has a claim and change order process. Notice in writing is typically required within a certain amount of time. You need to make sure that you're complying with all of those other notice uh, and time requirements of your contract. If you do make a claim, maybe based on the letter that I showed you or a change order request, and that is pending and you are signing and you're continuing to work and you're still receiving payments and you're still signing releases, you need to make sure that you carve out those issues, those pending claims from your release. Because if you look at most releases, you will see that when you sign a release, you're releasing all of your rights prior to the through date. So if your claim existed in March of 2022, that's when you submitted your letter, and now we're in um, April and May and June and July, and you're asked to sign releases in each of those months, you need to make sure that you have a, have a carve out that says this release excludes um, the claim submitted on March 15th, 2022, or PCO number 14, 17, and 19. So you need that exclusion so that you're not releasing your request just when you sign a release. Um, now, Ariel is gonna take a minute and talk about how the Sunray system um, allows you to generate, customize, and store your releases. Great, thank you so much. So in this Sunray application, you have the ability to create your pro progress payments and your um, your final payments. And of course, all of the forms are statutory forms. If you look at the first screen, it's very simple. If you're a Sunray customer, you can go in and under your actions, you can see the action items, click on your waivers and releases. And if we go on to the next slide, You could see here that you have three options. You could do, of course, sworn statement of accounts, waiver, release of, of uh, progress payment, final payment. And then on the right hand of this screen, you'll see you how all you have to do is enter in uh, your details. And if you go to the next screen, it takes literally no more than 25 seconds. Your actual waiver will appear. You can either create a PDF, it will, pardon me, the system will, will create it in a PDF or a Word document. You can add your logos to your waivers and releases. And then you can actually save all of your notarized and signed waivers and releases. Interestingly enough, in the state of Florida, it's not a statutory requirement to have your waivers and releases notarized and signed. However, everyone loves that official uh, stamp and um, you can save them all here in the Sunray application. Perfect, Ariella. So let's take a moment before we get on to the next section of the presentation and see if anyone has any questions. Ariella, does anybody, has anyone submitted any questions that we can answer about how to deal with material price escalations for existing contracts? No, no one has, and I'm surprised. One of the most important things that comes up all the time you know, people say, Ariella, we haven't been paid what, you know, we want to stop working. So 
I think making sure that that is a topic that you should speak with um, your attorney or Alex about putting in your contracts um, that provision so that you can stop working if you are. Right. So that's a great segue. So let's talk about what to do with your new contracts, contracts Perfect. you have not yet signed. Um, so obviously you want to make sure you add some type of escalation provision to your new contracts. Um, you want to consider both dollars and time. As I told you, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of clients deal with is that even if they were willing to absorb the cost increase associated with a certain item, a piece of material or equipment, it's taking a long time to get them. So for example, I was dealing with a client recently um, who is a contractor and they're getting custom millwork. And normally that was a eight week lead time. Currently, the manufacturer of this millwork is telling them that it is not eight weeks anymore, it's 17 weeks. Well, that's significantly affecting his project. So even if he's got no problem paying the cost increase, the time is a significant component. So you wanna make sure that your escalation provision deals with both getting more money and getting more time. Um, now, sometimes I hear folks tell me, but Alex, I've, I've got a firm quote from my subcontractors um, or my vendors, you know, I've got it all, I've got their prices locked in. So one of the things you should consider is the example I told you before, the idea that people are just walking away from their contracts. So even though they may have signed a contract and you have them in quotes locked in, they may decide, you know what, the prices continue to go up. I'm not going to deal with it anymore. I'm just not going to do the job. So you have a written contract that says that they have to honor their price, but you know what? They're not going to honor it. So now you've got to go back on the street and try to find someone else to give you that product, and it's going to take more time and cost more money. So even if you have vendors that have locked in your price and you feel really good that it's not going to change, your contract with your customer should still have an escalation provision. So I'm going to give you two sample escalation provisions that look at this issue from two different sides. So if I am a subcontractor with an owner, sorry, with a, a contractor, or I'm a contractor with a owner, so this is a provision that's good for me that I would like to try to have in the contract that I sign with somebody else. So let's, let's take a look at this provision. Where and when the delivery of materials is delayed or quantities are limited as the result of shortages, rationing, or unavailability, subcontractor shall not be liable or responsible for any delays or damages caused thereby. When this occurs, subcontractor may propose substitute materials or suppliers or alternate means of acquiring said materials and contractor and subcontractor shall negotiate an equitable price and time adjustment to this agreement. Additionally, when the cost of any or all labor or materials exceed 5% more than the price originally quoted to subcontractor, then subcontractor shall notice contractor in writing of such change and the party shall come to a mutual agreement on a new price. Until such time as subcontractor and, con and contractor negotiate any applicable price and time adjustments, subcontractor shall be relieved of further performance under this agreement this provision shall control over all other terms and conditions in this agreement and contract documents. Now, that is a very favorable escalation provision. And I'm here to tell you that, that it is highly unlikely that anyone will accept that as drafted, okay? Because it is so one-sided. But what's important is that it starts a negotiation, a discussion with the other side, that price escalation is real and we need to deal with it in this contract. So maybe it's not 5%, maybe it's 10%. Um, you know, there are ways to tweak that provision to make it more fair. But if someone asks you to provide them a escalation provision and you want it that, that it's good for you, that's a, that's a really good one for you. Um, 
so it was very general, but you know, depending on what you want, you know, you may decide that you are going to narrow the price escalation component to different things. Don't forget about freight, fuel, and storage. If those are big components of your um, business, then you need to make sure that you get them into the price escalation request and, and subcontract provision. So let's take a look at a contractor or owner-friendly um, escalation provision. So this is a provision where you want to put an escalation provision in, but you don't want to, you know, you want it to be um, good for you with the people that you are hiring. Um, so if I'm a GC, this is what I want in my subcontract, for example. If during the performance of the contract, the price of any specific material increases by more than 25% from the date the price was originally obtained to the date the material is purchased and subject to the conditions below, the subcontractor may seek an equitable price adjustment for an amount above, for amounts above said 25% increase. This provision requires all of the following to occur for an equitable price adjustment to take place. That subcontractor have documentable evidence that it obtained a firm written quote for said material and that said amount was carried um, in its bid to contractor. That the subcontractor used its best efforts to lock in said price for the duration of the contract and for the period when it would be it would need the materials on site and that subcontractor used its best efforts to timely order and schedule the materials at said original price. And the subcontractor has first used all available subcontractor bid contingencies and savings and, su and submitted its formal written request for equitable adjustment to contractor within 15 business days of its first notice that the price increase for said materials would exceed the 25% threshold. This provision applies to each material item individually and not any group of materials or all materials collectively. So just like the first provision I showed you um, is very one-sided, this is just as one-sided on the other side. It would be, I don't want to say impossible, I'll leave it at nearly impossible for a subcontractor to jump through all of these hoops to um, satisfy the price escalation requirements. On top of that, a 25% increase item by item is also very a very difficult threshold to overcome. That means that if drywall went up 23%, you get no price escalation. If steel pipe went up 27%, you don't get 27%, you only get the 2%, which is the 2% over the 25%. So you should be careful that when someone tells you that they're giving you a price escalation provision, that it actually can be achieved. Um, I had a plumber call me the other day um, and say, you know, this large GC in town gave me a price escalation provision. Alex, can you read it? Because when I read it, it doesn't sound like he's giving me anything. And it was written in a great deal uh, like the one I just read to you. Um, and it's true. It, it, it you might as well not have a, a, an escalation provision in your contract if that's the one you have to live with. Um, so, so be very aware of what it's going to take to actually get a price increase. Um, know, know that each of these provisions can be altered, changed, modified. You come up with any scenario or strategy you want to try to come to a understanding. Um, and what we are seeing some other ways that this problem is getting solved. When possible, we're seeing folks buy materials and store them. Keep in mind that's problematic because you have to deal with double and triple handling. You have to deal with ins insuring, making sure that there's insurance for this material wherever it's stored. You have to pay for storage. Um, what if it's stolen? What if it catches on fire? Um, what if it's vandalized? You know, who's going to bear all of those risks of loss as this material is waiting around to be installed? Um, what about the warranty associated with any material and equipment associated with purchasing now and storing it for a long period of time? None of these are insurmountable issues. They just have to be addressed and dealt with. 
Um, other ways we're seeing clients deal with this is getting more money and owning the risk. I've talked to clients and they said, you know what, Alex, I don't think this is going to last forever. I think that in six months, the price of lumber is going to come down. The price of drywall is going to come down. So you know what? I've told my the people that have hired me, I'm going to go ahead and increase the price by 5%, but I'm not going to have an escalation provision and I'm going to own the risk and I think I'm going to do just fine. So depending on how risk tolerant uh, or averse you are, you may decide to ask for a little more money at the time of contract and not get an escalation provision. Um, so with that, Ariella, do we have any questions? We do have a few questions. The first one is, would abandoning or walking off a project open you for a complaint to the DBPR? So the answer is almost certainly to the extent that your project is residential. So if I'm a, an example, I'm a roofer and I'm going to Mrs. Smith's house to install their roof and we sign a contract and it doesn't have an escalation provision and I have no right to get out of the job and I walk off the job and Mrs. Smith picks up the phone or submits a complaint to the DBPR, yes, that's going to be a problem. The DBPR is probably going to investigate this and you probably are going to have to deal with that. Um, on the commercial side, much less likely. Um, you know, if you're a commercial plumber and you're doing work at, you know, so-and-so mall, for a contractor or the landlord or, or the tenant and you decide not to honor your price and just walk off the job, we don't see those turn into DBPR complaints so much. And if they do, we see that the DBPR is much less interested in um, dealing with commercial related complaints versus residential related complaints. So it's not that you're it's not that you're out of the woods, um, but those are kind of the the uh, parameters within which we see an issue. Any other questions, Ariella? Yes, as a subcontractor, always bound by to the prime contractor with a flow through. Um, if discrepancy of subcontract and better provisions in prime, can the prime provisions prevail? Right. So the the question is. If I have to deal with the flow down provisions of the prime contract into my subcontract, how do I deal with that as I amend my subcontract? So the best way to deal with that is when you negotiate and um, modify your subcontract. We typically like that the, uh, the approach be used is an addendum. So you're gonna take all of the provisions that you want to modify and you're going to put them on a separate page so you're not going to mark up the actual subcontract you're going to have a separate document and in that separate document it's going to say that this addendum controls over this subcontract and all other contract documents so what we're going to do is we're going to say that this addendum now is the document that's going to control over everything and then you're going to amend the contract in two ways one, you may decide to strike certain provisions. So you may in the addendum say uh, the third sentence of paragraph 6.9 or, or article 6.9 is stricken or add in this new sentence in article 9.4 and you may write a new sentence. So the addendum is going to be kind of a, a line item by line item revision of the contract but you may also have what are called notwithstanding provisions which are great which say notwithstanding anything in the contract or the contract documents um, if my pay request is not um, approved and funded within 45 days of submission i have the right to stop work and that notwithstanding provision allows you to say that forget about whatever's in the prime contract the subcontract or any other incorporated document, this provision is the one that controls. So that's the way you're going to deal with that problem. Any other questions, Ariel? Last one is, um, of course, that you can, we're going to send out the webinar to everyone. Um, but the, another question within that question is, would the, that paragraph you just read out be acceptable to add to a quote? Would it be acceptable to add to a what? 
a quote, an, an estimate? Sure. Um, yes. So you could say, um, there, in your quote, you typically won't have a lot of terms and conditions. Um, so that's probably a very long way of writing it. Um, and again, we're talking about the first provision, not the second provision. So in your quote, there's probably shorter ways to write that. But yes, the, the, the short answer to your question is, um, if I am generating a quote that I'm going to give to someone with my price, um, I can include a price escalation provisions in my terms and conditions, and I want to use the first contract provision that I read, not the second contract provision that I read. Great. That's all we have right now. Okay. So a couple of things. Um, we have a podcast that comes out every week on construction, law, liens, bonds, contract issues, and collections. You can find that at theleanzonepodcast.com. Um, Sunray uh, has been putting on these presentations here and actually across the country for um, many, many years. Uh, it would be great if you could take a moment and point your camera at that QR code and leave Sunray a review. Um, that, as you know, online reviews are very important and um, Sunray values your uh, input. So if you could do that, that would be fantastic. The next thing I'd like to talk about is our upcoming webinars. We do this type of webinar uh, every month. We have different topics. You can go to sunray.com forward slash webinars. Um, our next presentation is how to get your retainage paid sooner. That's on Thursday, June 2nd. It's a 20 minute webinar. We'll go through different retainage provisions um, and the law on retainage to explain how it works and some of the things you can do to get paid sooner on your retainage. Um, and then on June 14th, we have a presentation, how to get paid after I send a notice of non-payment or bond claim. So you've done the work, you've submitted that claim to the surety, what's it gonna take to actually turn that claim into green dollar bills so you can make payroll and pay your rent? Um, we're gonna go through that process in great detail. You can sign up for these and all future webinars at sunraynotice.com forward slash webinars. And with that, Ariella, we are done so everyone can get on with their day. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to send Ariella uh, or me an email. We're happy to answer questions that you may come up with um, later. Uh, did I miss anything, Ariella? No, I think you did a spectacular job as always. Thank you so much for such detailed information that's going to help all of our listeners. It's such an important topic. So thank you so much again, Alex. You're very welcome. Have a great day, everybody.